episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another exciting episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And when it comes to talking about Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell, there is no better panel than what I'm about to present to you because it's not just a tagline. It is our reality here that we bring you the best guests uh, and uh, you will get your money's worth. Trust me when I tell you that. Uh, when it comes to me, I, I can't guarantee you that. But the guests, I certainly can. And of course, today we are uh, talking about Chad Daybell. It is very hard to believe that jury selection in the Chad Daybell trial is set to start on Monday. And uh, we're going to be bringing you another show uh, regarding jury selection in that trial on Monday, which is something that Steve Cohen and myself are working on. Uh, but of course, it is a a case that put the uh, accused killer's defense attorney, John Pryor, into the national spotlight. He uh, gave an exclusive interview to Scripps uh, News in Boise to a guy named Don Nelson. And the quote here is, all I can say is that Chad reached out to me and that's how it started. And at this point, we are ready to go forward and he wants to tell his story. Uh, so that's what we're about to do, about to hear his story and about to hear the breakdown from our best guests, Everyone knows and loves G Money, otherwise known as Gigi McKelvey, the podcasting rock star. She's host of the very popular true crime podcast, Pretty Lies and Alibis. She spent six weeks in Boise, Idaho, as did uh, Lori Hellis, the good Lori, covering the La uh, Lori Vallow Daybell trial for law and crime. Gigi did, as well as News Nation. She's produced over 50 podcast episodes on this case. So, again, you're not going to find someone with a broader knowledge base of this case than G Money or Lori Hellis or Eric Faddis. Eric Faddis is a former felony prosecutor. He dresses a hell of a lot better than me, and he's a current criminal defense and civil litigator. He is the founding partner of Varner Faddis Elite Legal, and uh, I found out, I believe, that uh, Varner is his wife. Is that right, Eric? That is right. My, my oh. partner in law oh, and in life. Getting, I don't know what that was. That was crazy. We got some crazy audio on your end. So I'm going to uh, see how we, I never heard that. That's uh, Eric, some crazy audio coming from your side. Uh, Still? Well, I'm, I'm, oh, now you're good. Now, are you there? I'm I'm here. Yeah. You sound great now. That Did, did everyone else hear that? Gigi, did it, Did you guys, or was that just me? That was weird. I heard a crazy, I don't know what just happened, but uh, it sounds like aliens landed. But Eric uh, is a founding partner and he works with his wife. Uh, he has uh, done it all. Court TV, ABC, NBC, Law and Crime. The list goes on. Uh, a seasoned litigator. And last, but certainly not least, you see it behind her. Uh, the Children of Darkness and Light. Uh, that is her new book. Lori Heller is both an author and a retired criminal defense attorney. And she moved from Arizona to Boise, Idaho, to cover the Lori Vallow case. And Lori, this is exciting. Uh, tell us, the book is out for pre-order. Where can people get it? Uh, any of the major book dealers, um, any of the major book outlets, Amazon, Goodreads, all of those places. Yeah. Excellent. So check it out. Uh, Lori spent all that time in uh, the courtroom and uh, it is worth a read. And uh, all I can do is say, check it out. I still am trying to figure out if aliens just landed in my ear. It's always weird when you get a crazy, it used to happen to me in news every once in a while. I get some crazy feedback. It would throw me for a loop. I'd look like a lunatic and everyone watching would be like, what's the matter with this guy? Uh, but anyway, that just happened to me. So uh, just some very quick background for those. Uh, and I know STS Nation is pretty well informed uh, on all of this. But um, last summer uh, in Idaho, uh, Lori Vallow was uh, sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow and uh, also got a life sentence for conspiracy to commit murder in the death of Tammy Daybell, Chad's wife. And uh, the kids, Tylee Ryan, uh, who are the real victims here, 16, and J.J. Vallow, his first name is Joshua, eight years old. They vanished without a trace back in September 2019. It sparked a multi-state search while their mother, Lori, appeared carefree. She even went on and married her 
lovely new husband, the little pudge ball named Chad Daybell on a beach in Hawaii. And then very, very tragically, um, nine months later, uh, JJ and Tylee's bodies are found in a pet cemetery on Chad's property uh, in East Idaho. And that is where he so uh, first and foremost, uh, Gigi McKelvey, um, what's it like for you, someone who's been so enmeshed in this trial, uh, covering it? And I know you're friends with some of the people like Larry and Kay, I, I become friendly with. Uh, what's it like for you that now we are uh, knocking on the door of Chad's trial, literally starting uh, Monday? It's about time. It's nearly four years later since the kids' bodies were found. And it seems, it, you know, my tagline is the long road to justice. And it really is that, you know, these families, everybody who knew and loved JJ, Tylee, Tammy, and then eventually Charles, Lori's in Arizona awaiting trial for Charles Vallow's death, as well as the attempted murder of Brandon, it just goes on and on. And I actually just got off the phone with Kay about an hour ago. She said to tell everybody hello. You know, I think everybody's ready for the trial aspect of these murders to be over so that they can try to find their normal. And I think those of us who have grown to love people we never will get to meet, unfortunately, are ready to see justice because it's um, been a long four years, uh, over four and a half, if you count the time that that we realized JJ and Tyler were missing. So I think it's just, it's time. Let's go. Let's do it. Uh, well said. And it's about to get to, by the way, Gigi, are you going out for it? Or are you sticking back in South Carolina? back and forth my oldest graduates in may so i have proms coming up my youngest is running track this year so um i'm gonna be in and out but not the entire time like last time it's mom duties call and that comes first but you know with it streaming it makes it easy i can be home in my pjs and still do what i do so uh, either way i'll be bringing that recap every night eight hours of testimony in an hour or less just so people who can't watch or don't want to watch can stay up to date on what happens in the courtroom every day. So yeah, I'm looking forward to being there and also being home some. And you better follow Gigi pretty lies and alibis on YouTube and also anywhere you listen to a podcast. So you better start listening. Uh, Asian posh Doreen, uh, just a, a quick uh, sidetrack here. Hey, SDS, did anyone see Maggie and Paul Murdoch? Another case that um, Gigi's covered extensively. Finally have headstones. I did see the photos depressing. So depressing to look at it, but glad they finally uh, have these headstones. Um, R.I.P. Maggie and Paul uh, is right. So uh, uh, a semblance of you know decency now that they've got at least that. But uh, obviously, Alec Murdoch is never going to visit those gravestones. And uh, what a tragic ending there. Uh, Lori Hellis, to you, um, same, same question. I mean, we're knocking on Chad's uh, trial door here, jury selection. Do you expect the attention here to be significantly less than what was given to Lori? Because he's, uh, I don't want to say ancillary to the case in any way, but he's a less big name than Lori. I don't think so. And, and one of the reasons I don't think so is I think this is going to be a very different trial. Um, I, I think that where we saw Lori Vallow's attorneys essentially um, going through the motions, I think we're going to see a much more contested, juicy trial this time. Um, John Pryor's not phoning it in. So. Okay. Interesting. Uh, we yeah. can get into some more uh, details about that. Wasn't Megan Connor supposed to be on today? Uh, she just looks a lot like Eric Faddis. No, she was supposed to be on. Um, she had it. Uh, she was traveling and she was trying to fit it in. Um, so she let us know and is my bad because I forgot to fix the thumbnail, but I'm going to put Eric Faddis's handsome mug on that thumbnail. And Megan is going to be on, uh, next week. I'm almost sure about that. Megan's Eric got a better beard than me anyway. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, STS nation, do I grow my hair, continue to grow it and slick it back like Faddis or do I buzz cut it? Um, like a soldier, let me know. Um, Eric. What a shallow human being I am, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm on the uh, fine line there between doing one or the other. Uh, Eric Faddis, have you ever shaved your head? Uh, uh, that would be uh, heresy for me. I would never do that. I'm a big hair guy, so not mm. happening, man. There you go. Never <laughs> shaved his head. Uh, that was possibly the most important question of the day. Uh, <laughs> same thing here. Uh, yeah, I don't think you've actually been to Boise to follow the case, but what has struck you, um, you know, about this whole 
story. I don't like to, I, I say saga a lot of times, but these are real people here. But what has struck you the most about this case? Um, probably just the multiplicity of deaths that have been associated with both Lori Ballow Daybell and Chad Daybell. When you when you look at over the course of years, how many people have perished? Children, um, ex spouses. Uh, it, it is just kind of unfathomable that that death would follow these two so closely and so frequently. Um, I, I just am shocked when I read about even even um, th there are some suspected deaths and some suspected shootings that they think might be associated with with um, Lori Valadebel and Chad Daybell. And so um, just these two uh, alleged death bringers and, and, and really the havoc that they've reaped upon their communities, um, uh, according to the allegations, are is pretty, pretty alarming. Mm. Uh, I swear to God, I wasn't going to bring it up. Uh, not supposed to swear to God, but uh, I just did. Uh, Jody Arrington, I got a message from Amazon. but book is arriving May 14th. Uh, I dragged Carm last night to see an author uh, whose podcast I'm hoping to get on. And uh, it was interesting, but Carm was uh, getting a little tired from me dragging her to Coral Gables, which is 30 minutes south of where we are. And I've got her literally running around all of America uh, in the first few weeks or the second few weeks of May. And uh, these are the same glasses, don't you worry. Um, so anyway, I had a bit of a panic attack last night wondering how Carm is going to do this. But I'm going to treat her like the thoroughbred that she is. I'm going to feed her well. I'm going to give her proper rest. And I'm going to uh, then let her out of the paddock. And I'm going to uh, let her run her race. And uh, she will do very well, I'm hoping. Uh, Sharon Ellie, always the big love for... Uh, Gigi here, G Money again, the rock star of podcasting. Gigi's great lover podcast. Of course, the two other guests are just as phenomenal. Uh, Chad, uh, this is the latest news involving the case. Uh, back to you, G Money. Chad has been moved to Boise from East Idaho. His charges uh, include conspiracy to commit murder and first degree murder in connection to the deaths of his wife, Tammy Daybell. And uh, the children, of course, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, uh, he has pleaded not guilty. But, Gigi, this guy, and a lot of people are already com commenting on it, and I know Larry commented on it. I'm going to get to it a little further down the road. He's, I guess, stoic is a word. I mean, he looks the same uh, no matter what is going on, just dazed and kind of confused looking and dopey looking and pudgy looking, but not to beat up on people, but I just did. And uh, do you think the reality is now starting to hit home for him uh, now that he's physically been moved over to Boise and he knows potentially his life is on the line here? I think it has to. I mean, yeah, there were a few times, the first few times they streamed hearings for Chad, I thought my computer was frozen. I was like, well, I need to reboot. And then he would blink. And I was like, oh no, he's just that, he's that still. You know, it's going to be interesting to see his demeanor in the courtroom. If you look back at any of the body cam footage, Lori is the one when approached by police. She's calm, cool, collected. Chad was always the nervous one. We heard it, or we, in the first trial, we heard that when they approached the apartments, when they were doing the welfare check, that Chad immediately got nervous. Lori just calm as a cucumber. I bet he is shaken in his little prison shoes right now. That's my theory. Mm. Or his <laughs> And uh, with By good, the way, I wanted yeah. to shave my hair in the Sinead O'Connor phase back in the mm. 90s. Just going to say, gee, money, you could pull that off. Um, but your hair is pretty the way it is. But I'm all I'm all about it. Um, equal equal opportunities for both men and women. But if I had Eric Faddis's head of hair, <laughs> definitely would not be shaving it off. But Eric, um, to you, I mean, just as an attorney speaking legally here, these charges are obviously the most serious. We're talking about conspiracy to commit murder, first degree murder, and the list goes on. And he's, if convicted, potentially facing the death, death penalty here. How does that up the stakes in terms of what we're about to see play out? Lori said she's expecting a whole different trial. And I'm going to get to good Lori about that in a moment. But what, what do you say about it? Yeah, I hear what Lori's saying. And I think that Chad Dable's attorney is going to pull out all the stops and you've got to in a death penalty case. Uh, you've got to raise every even colorable issue that you can think of in part to preserve that for appeal if there is a conviction, which it, it appears reasonably likely that there will be. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that, um, 
you know, th there are definitely going to be some differences. Lori Bell and Daybell's defense attorneys didn't even put on a case that they didn't even call a witness. And so I think we're, we're going to have st something that's going to be more heated um, and, and, and a lot more uh, in store in terms of fireworks for, for this trial. Mm. Um, this could be controversial, what I'm, what I'm about to say, but I mean it with the utmost love. I feel like if Faddis wasn't an attorney, he could be a professional or Olympic skateboarder. Do you skateboard, Eric? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, 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 um, I wore cool skater clothes back in the day, but, but back could not, the balance thing that doesn't work for me. Yeah. So no, oh, I did. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. Gigi's oh. a skateboarder Lord. And, and Eric Faddis, I feel like you have like tat sleeves and like a giant dragon tattoo on your back. That's covered by this suit. Can you reveal that? You know, I'm not going to derobe here during the stream, but I do have um, a, a massive lady justice on this side and then kind of an homage to the power of words and uh, oh. got, got some ink going throughout. What? So good. Good eye, Joel. There, look at this. I'm a good read of people. It uh, it holds up. Oh, look at what is that? A oh, tattoo right. of? Yeah. Lori, what is that? Lori's inked up. Yeah. Lori's a professional skateboarder. I didn't know. But That's what right. is a, Lori, what is that tat? Uh, it is mountain lupin, which is sort of my hometown's flower, and uh, a butterfly. I promised myself a butterfly for every book I publish, so I'm due Ooh. for a second one. You could have a tat sleeve by the time it's all said and done. That's right. Lori, let's go together. We'll get some ink. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. you, you know, as a Jewish guy, you're always threatened. If you get tattooed, you can't be buried. And that's what they tell you when you're a little kid. I don't think it's true because half of Israel is tattooed at the moment. I was there, and it'd be a problem to bury those people. But uh, anyway, that's what Karm told me. So I've never been tatted up. But hey, there's always uh, temporary tats. Um, yeah, I was 60 when I got the first one. So <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. The things we talk about during true crime. I love that's it. Right. <laughs> um, so so back, back to this for a moment, um, Lori, to you, the good Lori, just picking up on what Eric said. Uh, it sounds like you are expecting something completely different. In what sense and how is John Pryor going to be behaving uh, in this courtroom? Like, I assume quite aggressively from what I'm picking up on. Yeah, um, John Pryor is a is a much different, I would say, bigger personality than Lori's attorneys were. Um, you know, I mean, I practiced for almost 30 years and, you know, the personalities and I, I see, um, John Pryor is a much bigger personality, a much more assertive lawyer than, uh, than Lori's were. And, um, I think part of that problem was that Lori also, uh, really tied their hands. I mean, she really said, you can't bring up my brother. You can't bring up Chad. You can't throw him under the bus. You, you know, you can't bring up my mental health. They really didn't have a lot to work with. So those two things combined together, they essentially said, we're going to sit back and try and poke as many holes as we can in the, in, in the prosecution's case and we're going to rest. And that's what they did. Um, I think you're going to see a very different trial with John Pryor. He's always said all along he was going to call witnesses. He's got experts. He's he he is going to mount a full throated defense. Where I don't think we saw that with Lori. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, by the way, um, Black Widow from the Republic of Ireland, one of the women I fear in my life. Um, she pointed out. She said, "Hey, Joel's wearing a fancy shirt today." Um, I was asked to be on court TV and Carm always screams at me. I'm 54 years old. She calls me and yells and I have to wear a, she calls it a sport coat out of mm -hmm. respect to Vinny. And I'm kind of old school in that way, but there, it's too damn hot not to rub it in. But in Miami, it's very humid today. And so I'm opting for the fancy shirt. But if you want to watch, uh, I'll be on Vinny's show eight o'clock. We're talking Maddie Soto, another horrific story. So uh, there you go. But um G Money, you saw uh, up close and personal. Um, I always laugh when there's a typo like this. I hope Chud takes a stand. No, that's, that's, what, one that's what K calls Chad is yeah. Chud. Who yeah, does? I'm sorry. Lot, uh, K calls Chad Chud. That's oh, what a lot of people following the case call Chad. Right. Well, it's 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 very funny to me. I did not know that because my one of my oldest and dearest friends, who is a <laughs> let's just say he's a quirky guy. Um, He's a librarian, if that gives you some indication. One of the smartest people I've ever met. But his name is Steve Chudnick, and he's been known as Chud his entire life. So 
whenever I see Chud, of course, I think of Steve Chudnick, who's got an IQ of like 3,000 and sits and reads books all day, which is why. Um, Carm knows how to achieve her goals of no task for Joel. Uh, I am in a kind of a weird mood today, but that's okay. It'll make it a little more interesting than just talking about pudgy old Chad. But uh, G Money, um, you, you've obviously seen um, prior up close and personal. And uh, there were a lot of reports during Lori's trial that he'd be trial that he'd be trial um, overflow rooms just in like some kind of weird T-shirt hanging out. Um, what do you know about him? What do you know about the type of person he is and uh, all of that? First off, I just want to say that Lori's attorneys are really nice guys. I, mm -hmm. I want to put that out there. I know a lot of people don't like defense attorneys by default, especially mm -hmm. when they represent somebody like Lori. Two really, really great guys. Got to have some conversations with them and her investigator, Brandon. But, you know, it's totally different. And 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 Pryor did have a front row seat to what the prosecution had. I saw him in the overflow room, sat right behind him uh, on the defense side a couple of days. He was in the courtroom. And because they severed the cases, he was able to do that. Um, you know, he really didn't. Uh, he would kind of run from the media when he would leave. But he was conversational, would speak and was polite, you know, wasn't. But th there is a difference. And like the good Lori said, I mean, Lori really tied uh, Archibald and Thomas's hands behind their backs when she told him every plausible defense, mental health, uh, don't throw Chad or my brother under the bus. They really had nothing to go on. I mean, you can't defend these text messages that we read. You can't defend a loin fire and all that nasty stuff when she won't let you. So they had no choice. Prior, on the other hand, he's been feisty and fiery since day one representing Chad. And do I think it's going to end in, you know, a not guilty verdict? Probably not. But I think we're, you know, with Chad, he's going all in. And I think he's going to throw Lori under the bus and back over her for good measure. So it's going to be an entirely different trial, not only with evidence, but also with just what Chad is allowing his defense attorney to do on his behalf to where Lori just sat there and thought, the end. look, one thought I had, y'all. So on the 8th of April is the eclipse. You know, Chad's going to be like, it's coming. It's the end of the world. <laughs> it's coming. I told y'all. Save me. <laughs> yeah, here it comes. But yeah, so no, I mean, Pryor definitely was a fixture there for a lot of the trial and I'm interested to see how he does in the courtroom. If you're chewing out a cat in here, eating dog food right by me. Um, COE, COE, I have no idea what's going on, but that entire response, I'm getting this crazy alien feedback again. So I apologize. I've never heard this. You got to no, get your matrix, man. Because like you're breaking up a little bit on my end and your audio is kind of sounding weird to me. Wow, that is weird. Uh, but it's only happening when they are talking. Now it's sort of stopping. Super weird. Coe, do you have any? Are you hearing that? Hi, I don't hear it. But if you need to, you can uh, disconnect your mic and your headphones. Uh, even when you're talking, I'm hearing it. Coe. Anyway, we'll go on. Uh, I just might not hear any of your answers. That's all. Uh, but that's okay. I'll just smile and play along. But I could not hear any of that. Literally, sounds like. Um, I don't know. The devil is uh, coursing through my veins, screaming at the top of his lungs at me. I have no idea what is happening there. But um, it just means the tribulation really is coming. That's yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly it's back to normal. Now I'm actually getting scared. If this was, I know the COE, she's afraid, afraid of spirits. And if this was her, she'd be freaking out. But suddenly you guys sound great again. So we'll just have to deal with this and roll with it. But, um, Eric Faddis, to you, and again, I couldn't really hear Gigi's answer there. Um, you know, he Chad is facing the, the death penalty, potentially. So talk to us. If there's a conviction, what happens in, the, in this death penalty phase of this trial? And um, does it, it has to be, I assume, a unanimous decision by the jurors. That's my understanding in that jurisdiction. So, so really the trial it will be broken down into a guilt phase and a penalty phase. And so for the guilt phase, uh, the, the jury will hear evidence uh, as to Chad Daybell's guilt for these charges and, and make a determination thereon. If they convict him, then they go to the death penalty phase. The death penalty phase is a little looser. It, it's, it, it usually allows in more evidence and information than in the guilt phase. So we may even hear information about like Chad's childhood, you know, 
past trauma, stuff like that, that is often a topic that, that is raised in the death penalty phase. And so if we get to that, that point, I think it's going to be uh, some revelations there about sort of the personal lives of the individuals involved and how those may have factored into um, to what occurred. Just look at this guy, uh, Lori Hellis. Uh, what do you think Lori Vallow saw in this guy? I mean, I'm looking at a guy that looks like a retired milkman from 1951. What do you see here? Um, knowing what I know about Lori and having spent four years with this case and these people, um, Lori had a habit of, um, of getting involved with men who were not the, the, uh, best people in the world and uh and and rescuing them or saving them chad was really the first person who she told people was her spiritual equal um that all of the other people that she had been all of her other four other husbands had been people who she had um converted to the lds church they were not members at the time um, Chad, on the other hand, is a multi-generational member of the LDS church, raised in the church, and sharing a lot of those common um, teachings and understandings. So I think that was a lot of it. I mean, she said he was her spiritual equal. And, you know, I think just to add to that, Lori, I think that Chad filled her head with this goddess talk, you're mm -hmm. one of the chosen and that Lori always kind of had these delusions of grandeur. You know, she was in the Miss Texas pageant, what, in her her 30s? Who does that? And then she was on Wheel of Fortune. I mean, I think Lori always wanted to be like Lori famous. But when she really dove into these podcasts and started getting this alternative way of thinking, this dude comes along and he's like, you're a goddess. I was the brother of Jesus in a past life. I want to date you. And she's like, oh, my God, let's do this. It really was like gasoline and fire, those two. He thought he was a prophet. And in mitigation, I totally expect his little falls off the cliff where he slipped through the veil to come up. That, oh, he's had a head injury. This is why he turned into who he was. I mean, this dude until Lori was like in khakis pulled up to, you know, his mid chest and tucked in plaid shirts and a bad buzz cut with like 10 women who thought he was a prophet. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. And then you get Lori who comes along, who's, you know, to him, probably a little blonde bombshell that has done things he's never thought of before. And it was just toxic. And unfortunately, we got four people dead because of that. But I think they just fed each other's delusions. Yeah, four people, but we don't know what happened with Alex Cox. And uh, there are some other uh, possible question marks uh, in this case. Um, but definitely these are the two uh uh, two of the victims along, obviously, with Tammy and Charles Vallow. And, of course, Lori's about to uh, stand trial not too far from now uh, regarding that case. But, um, Lori Hellas, since you really dug into this, I'm just wondering if you have a comment about this. Uh, speaking about Ruby Frankie, you know, they just released video of the children, horrific uh, abuse there. And her journal does sh does show similar writings as what Lori believed in, that the children children, children – uh, someone else said Joe Ryan, but that the children were uh, essentially demons. And, you know, the elephant in the room is that they're both members or were members of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Any thoughts about this, Lori? Good, Lori? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about it because there are many more connections. Um, and um, I spend a great deal of time in my book uh, talking about those connections. But one of the really fundamental connections is a book called Visions of Glory, written by a man named John Pontius in 2012. And it really was a book where he writes down the near-death experiences of a man that they that is known by the pseudonym of Spencer. Um, Lori Daybell, uh, Chad was in her phone as Spencer. Um, and and she has some very deep ties to this um, this end of the world. This person who later uh, identified themselves and is a uh, a very well known LDS mental health provider um, had ties to Jody Hildebrand, had ties to Lori Vallow, had ties to Tim Ballard. 
um, the 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 ties to this this person whose name is Tom Harrison, Tom T H O M Harrison, um, and he. He, he is this person who believes that the end of days are coming, that he's had these near death experiences and um, they are, it has cultivated a faction within the mainstream LDS church who really believe the end of days are coming and that the church is in, in apostasy because of all of the progressive moves within the church and that the church needs to return to their roots in Joseph Smith and prepare for the end of days. And um, there, I, I describe it in the book as nesting Russian dolls. They are, they are actually these factions within the mainstream church that are really embedded in the church. These are not the same sorts of um, spin-off sex like the fundamental LDS uh, organization and and some of the other um, splinter sex like the, the polygamous group in in Mexico, the LeBarons. Um, this isn't what that is. These are people who are still very firmly in the mainstream church and in a lot of instances in church leadership that are um, deeply, uh, have deeply held these beliefs. So they're, they're related in, in really real terms. Um, the Tim Ballards, the Jody Hildebrands, all of those people, and they all know one another. Um, Jody Hildebrand, was, uh, Tom Harrison was one of her mentors mm. and was uh, uh, sat on a bunch of uh, continuing education panels with, with Jody Hildebrand, um, so there, there is definitely a relation amongst all these cases. You may recall earlier this summer, a woman named Spring Thibodeau who disappeared with her son and, um, they were caught at the Alaska Canadian border. She was convinced that her son was the latest Davidic servant prophet of the LDS church. And they were all adherents of Tom Harrison's. Wow. Uh, and I yeah. think was was it was it his book that Lori had in Hawaii? Yep. Yeah, it was his book under her yep. uh, on the beach chair. But uh, just following up here, good Lori with Nikki Cuds, friend of the show mm -hmm. here. Does the panel think do you, uh, Lori, think that Ruby's kids, uh, Frankie, would have wound up dead like Lori's children, similar to uh, Chad, she's saying. What do you think if it went on longer? It was up that they're definitely on that path, I think. I think there is a very good chance. Um, some of the most recent information that's come out in this big data dump that we got, including her journals and all of the um, Kevin Frankie's interviews, uh, is that Jody Hildebrand was shopping for property in Arizona that was going to be a, an enclave uh, for their group. And um, I, I don't, it would not at all have surprised me had they been able to succeed at that, that they would have found her children buried in the desert. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have no doubt that they, in reading Ruby's journals, her, her deeply held belief that her children were inhabited by demons, very similar to Lori Vallow. And I think it would have been um, a, a very small leap to we have to destroy their bodies to save them. Um, it's just sick. But a uh, web fan here uh, to G, G Money. Is there any study out there? And I, I'm sure you probably don't know the answer to this, GG, but a bigger question for you out there on why so many LDS members have doomsday delusions and believe, believing they are living deities. And now I'm afraid GG is going to be all garbled when she speaks for me. But um, GG, um, is it unfair to ask this question? I mean, unfair to the church, you know, LDS church is a legitimate religion, but there seems to be a lot of bizarre things, uh, situations emanating from the church. Um, is that, is that true of all religions? Are we being harsh here? What do you think? I mean, I think if you look hard enough in any religion, you're going to find people that think they are the, the one on earth to answer all questions. And I, I just try not to judge any any person who is LDS based on Lori Vallow or Ruby Frankie, it's not fair. Um, I know many people who are LDS who are good people and think this is just the worst thing ever. And it's hard for them because their religion 
has been in the spotlight in such a negative way for the last few years. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I think that any religion, you're going to see it. And unfortunately, it went to that extreme in, in these cases that it became worldwide news. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I did not study like theology or anything like that. But um, yeah, I just do think it's kind of unfair to group people who are practicing members that do it the way it should be done and compare them anywhere to these band of misfits that think they are, you know, uh, chosen ones. Nobody's chosen. Mm. Uh, yeah, no well, but I, I do want to jump in and say that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, much of their doctrine is very deeply steeped in the, the Bible book of Revelations and the idea that the end times are imminent. So that that is really, it is really baked into their doctrine. Uh, that does not mean that the church in any way sanctions any sort of the behavior that we've seen from Ruby Frankie or from Lori Vallow. I don't want to suggest that at all. But, you know, the question is why are why are they uh, they they so deeply into this doomsday idea? Well, it is baked into their doctrine. Yeah. And if you look over the course of history, a lot of really messed up things have been done in the name of religion sure. on a much larger scale. But it's it's a tale as old as time. Almost. I'm not I have no clue about what the Mormon faith entails other than what I've learned covering this case. But I mean, we could we could say that about I mean, I, I grew up in a Baptist church, so it's a lot of fire and brimstone. And so I kind of get it. You know, it's sort of that fear that's put into you at a young age that like if you don't do this or do that, you're going to you know, you're a heathen. So yeah, but I'm religion. Like for me, um, I don't know. It just, um, I hate when people give it a bad name because people, a lot of people have different faiths and they find their comfort in their own faith. And then you get these knuckleheads that just go extreme. And then, you know, people think that's what the religious body as a whole entails. And, and it doesn't, but look back from the beginning of time, people have been slaughtering people in the name of whatever God they're, they're claiming, you know, as long as men have been walking the earth. Uh, I have to agree with that. It has been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, note to self, Joel, your book is set to arrive May 15th. And now you tell me I can get a signed copy from your mom. You sure can sign survivorbook.com. They brought it up. Not me. Uh, honestly, this whole book process is so new to me. I had no idea what's going on. I'm still being spun around trying to figure it all out, but uh, the signed copies from Carm and myself, those are, um, limited edition hardcover. The other book is going to be paperback. So if you want to get it as a gift, that's uh, signsurvivorbook.com. Uh, and um, that obviously uh, is something that is available in addition uh, to the paperback. But um, Eric Faddis, back to you. Um, everyone is asking, is Chad going to testify in this case? And uh, being the defense attorney, Lori saying no, but uh, Eric Faddis, what say you? You know, it's it's gonna be it's likely gonna be a game time decision. It's gonna depend on how the evidence plays out. But but what it looks like is kind of the walls are closing in on Chad Daybell, and, and I'm not sure how many outs he really has here. Now, granted, he may put put forth a vigorous defense. Is that gonna involve him getting on the stand and telling his story, like 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 his attorney John Pryor intimated? Um, I, I'm not sure. You know, one thing we have is we have all these text messages um, that, that are uh, many of which are pretty uncouth and pretty uh, painting him in an unsympathetic light. And so if he gets on the stand, you better believe he's going to be peppered uh, with questions about these text messages and what they mean and, and um, how they sort of incriminate him. So if he does, he, he does so at his own peril. Mm. Uh, it's always dangerous, obviously. Uh, Rosemary Romero then had a follow-up question. Chad's children, uh, Eric, have been standing by his side. They did TV interviews. I think it was 2020. They think their father's innocent. Great guy, which doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Um, by the way, shout out to Al Analytical Blarney AB uh, for the memberships. Appreciate that. And uh, Kathleen became a YouTube member, so thank you. But what about his children? Uh, is there a better chance, do you think, that his children get up there as character witnesses and say, my dad's a wonderful guy. Uh, just because he looks like a dopey retired milkman doesn't mean he's a bad guy. 
that's a less risky approach because you put people up there who, who um, do not have the same legal baggage that Chad Daybell has. And so they can't be impeached in the way that Chad Daybell could be impeached. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they put some folks up there um, who say, you know, that he couldn't have done this or, or they talk about his character for peacefulness or, or whatever, something like that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there are a number of people close to Chad who testify, but whether whether the big dog gets up there and, and um, takes that stand, I'll, I'll be interested to see. Yeah, uh, Got Donuts is a friend of ours from Toronto. There are three basic motives for murder, uh, sex, money, and revenge. This case has all three dressed up in religion, but it is basic murder. Good point. By the way, Got Donuts, I better meet you May 21st when I'm up there with Carm. Uh, Lori, um, just uh, elaborate so you don't think there's any chance in hell chad's testifying uh explain why and then will we see his children get up there i think that uh chad is very devoted to john pryor i think that he has a great deal of trust in john pryor and i don't believe that john pryor would advise him to take the stand so mm -hmm. i i don't think there's any reality in which he does that i i also say chad is a kind of a compliant guy who it very much um it, it, it's funny because there are places where he goes rogue uh, but for the most part i think that he follows the rules and follows uh i know it sounds funny saying that but i, I think that he uh respects hierarchy and so i think if his lawyer advises him not to he won't and Can you imagine how boring that would be? I mean, like, he's so monotone, like, I did not know the cat from the backyard. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Lori, I was going to ask you, like, when I want to hear about, what about the children? Will they, will they testify his children? Possibly. Um, you know, I hear things from, from people who live out in Rexburg and, and I, I have heard that they may not be the sort of monolithic group of support that they that they were originally. There may be some that are a little bit less supportive than they were initially. But I, I think his daughter, Emma, is absolutely will never back down and is absolutely on his side. And it, it actually wouldn't surprise me to see them put her on. And, well, Garth, too, because Garth was a witness to Tammy Daybell's death. So I'm you know, uh, are they going to call him? That would be interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, the, the perplexing thing is he was the only other person in the house. He was asleep. Um, Chad supposedly woke him up to help him, uh, to have him help put Tammy back in the bed. So I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to see whether or not he's called as a witness and, and whether he's called by the defense of the prosecution. Yeah. And, and, and Chad, Chad's children are all older, right? Uh, they're all I, adults. They're all yeah. adults. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, good Lori, you know, you say that Chad is a kind of a rule follower, which is counterintuitive, counterintuitive, obviously to, uh, being a murderer, but curious what you learned in your book that would be of interest to the public about Chad, uh, that you didn't expect. I think that is an element of it. I, I think Chad always wanted to feel special. He was the eldest of five children. His parents were always very absorbed with the younger children, and he kind of was left on his own. And I think that he always wanted, very much wanted to feel special. So I, I think he looked for opportunities to, for him to stand out, whether it was him um, acting a fool and clowning at high school uh, assemblies to telling people he'd had near-death experiences. So I, I think he was always looking for a way to stand out. But, I, and I, I don't want to go back to the church particularly, but, but people within the LDS church live in a very, in a culture that being a member of the LDS church is as much cultural as it is religious. And, um, and, and within that culture, they are a very um, rule following, hierarchical, respecting sort of a, 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 of a community. And so I think that's his roots. And, and I think that's his default. 
but he certainly went rogue a time or two, you know, I mean, he went rogue and, and uh, sealed himself to Lori in the temple after knowing her for two weeks. And, and that, that in itself is, it would be incredibly antithetical to, uh, to, to his faith. Yeah. Not uh, enough stage in the world to cleanse that temple, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, I'm going I'm going to get back to Eric in a moment about jury selection and what he's anticipating but Gigi this is a question that always comes up and I saw it in the chat a lot in the chat not chat but in the chat a lot about Chad and Lori saying look they're both mentally ill but the the world is filled with you know people dealing with mental illness who do not commit these crimes but do you see do you view um Chad and Lori as ultimately suffering from I mean you have to suffer from mental illness to do what they did, do you think? You know, I I think for me, it was confirmed watching Lori for six weeks solid and then at her sentencing that there is something not right with her. But you can be mentally ill and be culpable because when Charles was killed, what did they do? Instead of going in the police station and saying, hey, he was a demon. We took him out. We did the world a favor. She told a lie. When they came knocking to see where JJ was, oh, he's with Melanie Gibb in Arizona. He's he, she's telling other people he's in Louisiana with his grandma. K. why did she not tell the truth? Because she knew she would end up where she is, which is in prison. Actually, she's in Maricopa County Jail right now awaiting another trial. But yeah, you can be both. You can have mental illness. Chad, I tell you, I don't know that the guy's mentally ill so much as he just got off that these people actually bought that he was the brother of Jesus in a past life. Lori, her actions, everything definitely something wrong, but doesn't mean she's innocent or that she shouldn't be punished because you don't hide it. You know, I remember a case years ago in Miami where a guy beheaded somebody and was walking down the street, holding the head up. That is crazy. That is where you are parading what you just did. When you lie to cover it up, you know what you did. You can be, you can have mental illness, which is nothing I wish on anybody. But when you lie to cover it up, you're lying because you don't want to go to prison. You want to keep living this fantasy life as a free woman. It's like, but how did they think nobody ever would want to see J.J. or Tally again? If they hadn't have killed the kids, they might have got away with murdering Charles and Tammy. It wasn't until the kids went missing that they took a second look. Charles was initially ruled self-defense. Tammy, healthy woman in her 40s, dies in her sleep. No big deal. She's buried. But when they killed the kids, that's when all the skeletons came out of the closet. And you realize these guys are like serial killers. It's crazy. But no, I think she's she's mentally ill, no doubt. But she's not dumb. It's uh, it's wild. Uh, this whole story is wild. And I think that's why it's intriguing, not only for people here, but I'm seeing people in Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand in the chat tonight who are uh, equally um, just mesmerized by the insanity of all this. Uh, just wanted to let you know, behind the scenes, the COE is working really hard with Space Coast uh, to build up Patreon. And we're going to be bringing you exclusive shows very soon on Patreon. Uh, these are some of the friends of the show who are supporting us there. Real Happy 33, Susanna Mattingu, uh, I Got Some Paperwork, Diane D, Allison Nothing But Good, Lauren Z, Margaret D, 597, Bobby, HB Girl, and Dakota Janie Rain. What a name. Dakota Janie Rain Grimaldi Lane. It even rhymes, and uh, she's in the UK. So uh, please, if you can, I don't even know the link where you find that. The COE will let you know, but... Uh, uh, become a uh, member of Patreon, and uh, it's fun. We'll send you stuff from uh, the stupid things we do, like when I'm going to drag my kids to uh, Kids Day at the Miami Open on Saturday. So all these silly kinds of things. Cynthia in Spain wants me to drag Carm there. Let me get through the two weeks here in America, and uh, I'll work on that afterwards. But um, Eric Faddis, to you, what do we expect on Monday? Jury selection starts uh, the whole voir dire process. If you are Chad's defense attorney, if you are John Pryor, who are you looking for? Are you looking for retired milkmen? Who are you looking for to be on your jury? Oh gosh, that's a tough one. You know, um, you one one topic that's going to be huge during jury selection is the death penalty. It always is, and and they're going to ask about you know whether a person has religious reservations or other reservations that that might inhibit them from from uh, passing judgment or determining death in a case like this. 
Um, you know, I think they're going to talk about and, and, and learn about um, people's religious backgrounds. And, and um, uh, they're also going to be talking about folks uh, who might have a blended family. I, I think that, you know, um, th there are different dynamics with a blended family that, that don't necessarily appear in, in a, you know, old school like nuclear family. Um, and so I think those are important. I think they're going to talk about and, and try to find people who understand how an individual can be impressionable, how they can be vulnerable, how they how they can be swayed and influenced. And 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 I think that perhaps at the trial, Jed Daybell is going to sort of run the defense of, oh, Lori, what was actually the monster here? She she's she is uh, the person you want. She's already been convicted of these deaths, and Chad was was perhaps influenced by her. That could be an avenue that they explore during jury selection. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe trying to suggest that, that there, someone is making Chad out to be the scapegoat when Lori is really the ringleader, whether that's accurate or not, that, that, that's a different that's a different question. But I think that they're going to explore those topics during during blood year. Mm. Uh, once again, the demons came back in my ear. I was actually going to take my headset off and try to play it <laughs> for you. It's still happening. It's so weird. COE, you better get in here and figure this out because I never will. COE, bring um, some but water Lori, water. to you, same thing. Um, this death, you know, the death penalty phase obviously is critical and crucial, but we start with the uh, with jury selection on Monday. Um, the flip side of that is the state. Who are they going to be looking for in terms of jurors that they want uh, in that jury box come uh, trial time? Well, they're going to be looking for conservative people, parents, people who uh, who don't necessarily have a. Uh, an objection to the death penalty, uh, folks who, uh, they're going to be looking for people who don't know very much about this case, which is difficult. Uh, both sides, I think, are going to be looking for that. And uh, I think surprisingly, because there is so, by so many of the people who are involved in this case are members of the church, I think they're going to be looking for people who are not members of the church. I think um, one of the things that has been of concern is the idea that having someone who is a member of the mainstream church and who really objects to the fact that they have made their faith look so bad, uh, they're going to hang them. So uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that both sides are saying, we really want to avoid people who are members of the church. Um, I think that was one of the biggest factors in, in moving the case from Rexburg to Boise. And that's that the population in Rexburg, the community of Rexburg was actually um, settled by the by the church. And so um, somewhere around 95 percent of the people within uh, in the, the population in Madison and Fremont counties are church members um, in the Boise area. That statistics about 16 percent. So I think they had a much better ch uh, chance of. And I think in Lori's trial, they definitely, um, during the trial, the issue of, of religion was not as um, it focused on as much as you would have expected. And I think that's the reason why. Mm. Uh, Challenge Star says, I live in Idaho and hope that uh, Daybell gets the book thrown at him. I think a lot of people are feeling that way. Uh Kay and Larry Woodcock, uh, Gigi obviously said she spoke with them just today, but they were uh, they've been interviewed lately and uh, they say that they are traveling once again from their home in Louisiana uh, for the proceedings. Larry Woodcock had a great quote. Uh, he called him a wimp of a man and then went on to say, I'm totally confident that he'll be found guilty. Uh, he continues, if you took a picture, he says, of Chad on April 1st in court and you found a picture of him four years ago when he was in court. I don't think that there's any change. His demeanor hasn't changed. His attitude hasn't changed. He's so blasé and just a wimp of a man. Um, Gigi, just wondering in your conversation uh, today, if uh, you know Larry and Kay were speaking about Chad specifically and just more broadly, uh, obviously this has been you know, the weight of the world on them for so long. And they're such nice people. Um, do you think this trial, I hate to even ask this question, might be a touch easier for them uh, having gone through Lori's trial? We really actually didn't talk about the trial too much. We just kind of caught up personally. But 
I think that, look, it's it's peeling off whatever scab kind of came over the wound after Lori's verdict is slowly peeling that off because now they got to start again at day one with different details. We're going to learn about Chad's electronics where we didn't learn about that at Lori's trial. We're going to learn about his phone pings at key times. Um, I'm looking for testimony from the people that he told that Lori um, was an empty nester or that Lori didn't have kids. It's just going to be such a different heartache for them. But ultimately, I think that when this is wrapped up, they have one more to go, which is for Charles and Brandon Boudreaux out in Arizona, Lori's fourth husband, who Alex Cox shot and killed. And then Brandon Boudreaux, who was the husband of Melanie's, or I call her Melanie's because there's two Melanie's. Um, so that, you know, they, they've dealt with this for so long. I think they're just ready to get it started so that it can end. I think that they're confident in the prosecutors. It's an excellent team they have there. And I'm sure they're going to bring it home like they did with Lori. And here's the thing. I think there's going to be more evidence against Chad. If you look at it, Lori's case was largely circumstantial. You had the one hair in that was found on JJ. And even the prosecution, like I think they conceded. Yeah, I mean, she lived with him. It's, it's easy. I think there's just going to be more evidence against Chad. And look, the kids were found on his property. How is he going to say, no clue, I was asleep. They must have buried him while I was asleep. No, he was a grave digger. JJ he was there two plus hours when Tyler was being buried with JJ. It was a matter of 20 minutes, maybe. That that grave had roots that had been cut. What did Chad do for a living? He was a grave digger. Slam dunk case. And I think that they're just ready to hear guilty, done, bam, let's get Lori over with. And then finally, for the first time in four and a half years, they can live a life without litigation and trials just lingering over them. And I think that's what anybody that knew and loved any of these people want. Chad's family included. None of them asked for this. Chad's kids, I don't fault them for loving their dad. They were raised in a way I probably wasn't. So, you know, I just hope everybody finds peace. And Summer Shiflet, you know, good grief. I, I know Summer got a lot of hate by people before this trial, but man, the day they played that phone call in court, my heart shattered for her. I mean, it's just, you hear how far reaching the devastation was. And just at that call, that might've been the biggest moment in that trial for me was hearing that raw emotion of this conversation between Lori and Summer, where her sister realizes she's been duped. Lori took her for a ride because most siblings are going to back you up. No way she would kill her kids. They're just hidden. No way. And then you find out they're dead. It's just, it's all powerful, but um, I think they're ready. You know, they're ready to get this done. And and I think that justice for all of the victims is kind of what gives them that little shot of adrenaline when nothing else does. Uh, well said. Uh, Fattis, back to you, uh, the beautiful hair man. Um, Chad wishes he had your hair. But um, what what is John Pryor doing? I mean, obviously we're it's almost game time right now, but the last couple of weeks, when you're literally going to have the highest profile trial in the country, you're going to have the spotlight. Uh, what was he doing these last couple of weeks? If you had to guess, leading up to Monday, uh, sweating. He uh, th this is an <laughs> extremely high stakes trial. Um, it is is nationally publicized, and at least from the publicly available information, there hasn't emerge this like ironclad defense or anything like that. Um, so, but I think he's, he's frantically preparing, uh, probably doing follow-up interviews with witnesses, um, combing through all of the uh, media dumps and, and cell phone dumps and that kind of thing to look for little morsels that, that he can uh, latch onto and try to amplify in a way that could translate to reasonable doubt. You know, oftentimes uh, the defense attorney has to shift the narrative that there is, there's clearly a national narrative about this case. We're all talking about it on this podcast. And so I think that he needs to at least theorize, how can I change the game? What is a different perspective that I can try to present to these jurors that may lead to some better outcome for my client? Um, and so I think, you know, scrambling and sweating and um, trying to find something to latch onto. Mm. Uh, by the way, Eric, does your wife uh, do the uh, punditry thing or just you? Oh yeah, no, no, she she dabbles too. She's uh, yeah, she's uh, she's a much much more of a looker than me. So uh, well, ne next show great. we'll get her on with you. Uh, how about that? Um, Beautiful. We'll I'll let yeah, her know. One hundred percent. What's her first name? Her name's Lauren. So she's Lauren, Lauren. Varner, okay. and uh, like I said, my partner in in law and in life. 
there that's, you, so that's beautiful that's awesome <laughs> tell lauren varner we're gonna have her on with eric faddis next time um stephanie b here says uh, uh Lori, i don't know about this am i mistaken or did i hear they had evidence of the children on chad's tool that were in the home i think i recall an axe mentioned can you fill us in on this good Lori? yeah um there were uh tylee's dna was found on tools in chad's tool shed um, including a pickaxe and um, a couple of other tools that were reportedly used in destroying her body. Yeah. Mm. Uh, horrific. Um, yeah, really could have been dismembered in that barn. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to get gross, but you think about it, there was nothing in those townhomes. So that's what I'm interested to find out. If you remember, the crime scene photos showed they were doing the, I think the Pharaoh scanner. You could Ooh. see the on the uh on the outside of that barn i'm curious to see other than what we found on the pickaxe did they find any signs that the dismemberment took place in there had to have been somewhere and you think about adam cox driving from those townhomes with two bodies at two separate times in his truck alex yeah. alex uh, yeah. who did i say adam. you said adam <laughs> oh I'm sorry adam. Hey, he's, he's on my show next week i, still yeah, need Adam's, I, I like adam i, yeah. I do. they're they're nice people yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, with Alex, you think about how brazen, I mean, yeah. Alex fell hook, line and sinker for all this. I mean, yeah. he was hundred percent invested, but to drive two kids bodies at two separate occasions across town. Um, I've made the drive from the townhomes to Chad's. It is not a, a, a around the corner drive. Um, by the way, uh, speaking of Alex, Gigi, was he cremated? Because someone earlier was asking, he was, right? Someone was asking if they're going to exhume him, but there's no way to do that. Uh, we're never going to know, right? We're never going to know. They saved some of uh, some of his tissue, um, but, you know, they reopened or they re-examined it, I believe, but it was natural. I will die on the hill. He did something to off himself. The day after Tammy is exhumed, I mean, I, I just, too coincidental for me, but apparently the medical examiner differs in opinion, but you know, I think um, that patriarchal blessing was a really big key right before he died. Um, I think they called and said, your, your, your time's up, buddy, go, go to your next world where you'll be a prophet or whatever. Wow. Freaky. Um, yeah. I, what was my question? Oh, uh, Lori Hellas. Good Lori. Um, there was a lot of talk, you know, at one point that John Pryor was going to step down because, um, you know, Chad couldn't pay him anymore. People were joking that he now owns Chad's house. So what, what happened with that? That's part one. And then uh, we'll get back to the Chad's remorse thing, but Jersey Jen, uh, talking about him not being death penalty certified. So how, how does that all work? If you can speak to that. I am happy to explain that. <laughs> Please do. Please do. So in the state of Idaho, um, and in most jurisdictions, um, if you retain a lawyer, you are responsible to be sure that your lawyer has the appropriate qualifications and is qualified to do the case that you've hired them for. If, on the other hand, you are have a criminal case where the state is providing you with a, a public defender, the state has certain guidelines that you are required to meet certain qualifications that you are required to meet. So while retained attorneys are not required to be state death penalty certified, um, appointed public defenders are. So because Chad Day Daybell retained John Pryor, um, John Pryor is not required to be death penalty certified. He's also not required to follow what are considered to be the American Bar Association's best practices in capital cases. So, um, for example, the ABA says you should hire a mitigation specialist. Um, it came out in one of Chad's or uh, one of Chad's uh, recent um, pretrial hearings that they don't have a mitigation specialist. And John Pryor said, I'm not required to do that because I'm not bound by the ABA best practices. Um, I think it's I, I think it's short-sighted, but it, it's a money issue. So what happened was when Lori and Chad came back from Hawaii, when Lori was extradited back from Hawaii and Chad came back um, voluntarily, 
Chad had collected $430,000 on Tammy Daybell's life insurance. When he came back several months later, what was left of that was $130,000. That quickly was eaten up in, in legal fees. At the point that he ran out of money, he signed the equity in his home over to John Pryor. It's not an unusual, Eric can tell you, it, uh, uh, it's not an unusual occurrence to have someone either give their lawyer a lien against their property or actually give them, deed it to them. Um, it happens. It's not as if um, it's it, it was unknown until this happened. So that was roughly another $85,000. Now, we know that death penalty cases uh, easily cost in the millions. Um, the, uh, the, the state and the county of Fremont had already spent $3.4 million before Lori Vallow ever came to trial. They spent another million and a half um, getting her through her trial. So and that is very typical. We usually think about somewhere between four and five million dollars to get a death penalty case through trial on each side. So we know that they're operating at a disadvantage. What we didn't know until recently, uh, when they had a, a, a hearing recently, was that last January in a closed door hearing, which the judge in this case is quite notorious for, um, they, uh, John Pryor went to the judge and said, Chad's out of money. He's now, uh, uh indigent and I'm going to continue on the case, but I need help. So it was a year ago that the judge said to John Pryor, I will authorize, uh, expenditure of funds for a co-counsel who is death penalty certified, if you can find one. Um, Eric also knows that we are we have a terrible shortage of uh, defense attorneys these days, and um, it is due to the fact that the states aren't paying their attorneys and people can make a lot more money in a lot of other areas rather than acting as public defenders. So there is a real shortage in Idaho. There are roughly 20 attorneys in the whole state who are death penalty qualified and not all of them are qualified to be lead death penalty counsel. So John Pryor was told if you can find someone to come alongside of you, uh, you can hire them. And he was unable to do that. So shortly before the trial was about to begin, John Pryor went to the judge and said, I want to withdraw because if I withdraw and Chad no longer has any lawyers, the state is going to have to find him lawyers to represent him. And I feel like I can't be effective because I'm a, I'm a sole practitioner and I can't find anybody to come and help me. And by the time the hearing was over, John Pryor, who is a little bit of a, has a little bit of an ego, um, made it very clear to the judge that he didn't really want to get off the case, that he has a relationship with Chad. Chad trusts him. He doesn't really want to get off the case. And money wasn't his motivating factor. He really was trying to get additional help for, for the trial. And by the time this convoluted end, uh, hearing ended, the judge denied his motion to withdraw. Um, he did renew uh, the order saying, if you can find somebody to help, this I'll we'll make sure the state pays for it. But um, that hasn't been possible. As far as I know, uh, John Pryor doesn't have any assistance. Wow. I cannot imagine trying a 10 week trial alone. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Eric, I, how do you do that? Um, I like vomited myself. That, that, that That's just so <laughs> terrifying to even think of. Right. It's so daunting. A normal like four day trial is, is really hard. And so 10 weeks, are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, the longest trial I tried in, in 30 years was a two-week trial. It was absolutely exhausting. And I can't imagine just the idea of hoping that for the next 10 weeks, you're going to stay healthy, that you're not going to get sick. And, you know, remember that for every hour you're in court, you're spending two hours of prep time. And so 
the eight hours a day, how, how does that work? How do you get any sleep and, and have any semblance of, of immune system? Yeah, we, we, um, I'm getting that crazy feedback again, but we did see, um, recently Dan Rashbaum, it was a sh much shorter try eight days, but he, ba he had co-counsel, but he was basically running the entire show. She was there, I think just from, um, like an appellate, uh, perspective, taking some notes, I think, but, um, but yeah, 10 weeks, that's mind boggling. Um, I was going to ask Eric Faddis, since we've been asking you all the legal questions, uh, it was asked earlier, is Chad going to show remorse? Is he even capable? I don't know if he can show it on his face. You know, uh, we, at least in my appraisal, we haven't seen it from him yet. In fact, I haven't seen any kind of semblance of, of, of an emotion that, that could be misinterpreted as remorse. So, um, you know, it, and, and one thing we'll have to see, he can't really show a lot of that during the guilt phase. Um, I mean, he can show emotionality and he can, he can show that this is a grave situation and he, he understands that, but in the guilt phase, he can't show a lot of like, I'm sorry for what happened. Um, but if we get to the death penalty phase in most jurisdictions, um, you know, the, taking responsibility or, or showing remorse that could be considered even as a mitigating factor by the jury. And so I'll be interested to see if it gets to that death penalty phase, which it likely will, um, if his tune kind of changes. And if we see some sort of expressive behavior from him that we haven't seen yet. Hmm. Uh, I got to be honest in here. Where do your answer? Because the oh, demons are, are in my ear, but it sounded good to me. And uh, we got to get to get this sorted out with the COE. Uh, this is an interesting question to Gigi from Rosemary Romero. Uh, a couple more points and then we will begin to wrap up. Uh, it's especially hard to do a show when you can't hear what the guests are saying. It's been pretty good, except with uh, a few exceptions. And uh, it's more Space Coast's uh, purview. But Rosemary Romero here. Uh, to Gigi, why isn't Chad being charged in Charles Vallow murder trial? Wasn't Chad making phone calls to the funeral homes asking how much it would cost to bury Charles? Uh, are they going to bury Chad on this one eventually? Well, they just said there was not a likelihood that they would be able to get a conviction. So just not enough evidence. And I, I think a lot of this case, really what we've seen is relied on digital evidence text messages, phone calls, phone pings with Alex Cox pretty much pointing investigators right to where the kids' bodies were. I mean, it, it's really obvious he knew, but the, the big thing is they have to prove that in court beyond a reasonable doubt. And according to prosecutors there, they didn't have it. Hmm. So we can all sit here and say he should be charged. He should. We all know he knew, but uh, just probably wasn't enough evidence, which is why I think we haven't seen more charges in this case, you know, or maybe they had enough evidence to arrest for smaller charges for people like Melanie's or Melanie Gibb, but their testimony is more, well, Melanie's didn't testify, but you know, with Mel with Melanie Gibb, her testimony is worse for Lori and Chad than what little charges with no criminal history that they might've gotten her on. Uh, but with Chad, I just think that it, it wasn't there. They didn't have the text messages, emails or whatever they needed to prove it. Hmm. And that really stinks because, um, you know, until Chad, Lori and uh, Charles, I mean, I don't think they had the happiest marriage, but I think that she would have stayed because Charles took care of her and really gave Colby and Tylee the stability they never had before he came in the picture. And then we know he was very hands on, such a good dad to JJ. Uh, but I guess uh, religious delusions over a comfortable life with uh, with a good guy. Uh, and by the way, uh, on our best trials channel, we're going to be streaming live the uh, Chad Dell uh, Chad Daybell trial from gavel to gavel all 10 weeks uh, beginning this Monday. Got the thumbnails ready to go for the COE. Uh, so make sure uh, COE, if we can put a link up, that's our second channel. Uh, if you have not subscribed, please do so. And we're going to have legal analysis on certain big days. We'll get Lori Hellis. We'll get Eric Faddis. We'll get Lauren Varner, uh, more importantly, and others to come on on big days uh, to give you legal analysis as the trial is playing out, but um, you'll be able to watch it and and chat with uh, members of STS Nation on the Best Trials channel. Please check that out. By the way, tomorrow there's another person in a bit of trouble. Um, the Notorious COE. Only Joel can do a 90-minute show without being able to hear half of what the guests I, I want to play uh, finally 12 years later. I'm impressed. You're the best, Joel. Thanks, COE. You're the best, too. Um what a sweet moment. One of the sweetest moments on our show ever right there. It just happened. Um, next time it does happen, though, I'm going to put my headset on the microphone 
so people can hear it so they don't think I'm insane. And I'm worried, COE, because I'm doing court TV in an hour and 45 minutes. So uh, I'll just have to roll the dice. But I can't be telling Vinny, hey, Vinny, I can't hear you because I've got demons in my ear. It's not going to go over well. So we've got to figure that one out. But um, another guy who's in a heap of trouble, and we're going to get a really interesting breakdown tomorrow from Phil and Scott. Um, it might be an early time tomorrow, 1130 a.m. Eastern. I'm still talking to them, but we are going to look at Diddy, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, P. Diddy. Um, some people are calling him the black Jeffrey Epstein or the not Jewish Jeffrey Epstein. We're about to find out, but it sounds like that guy is in a world of hurt uh, coming his way. Uh, this, look at this, a uh, super sticker here. Gigi is one hardworking woman and mom. Yes, she is. Thank you, uh, Sherry. Yeah, so kudos. Thanks to uh, everybody who donated. And to my mods who always have to come on at the last minute because I stink at telling people. And I'm not sure why I look like I'm jaundice. I feel like <laughs> I look to work on this lighting situation. <laughs> There you go. Um, there was a question up there that I took down. But one of the other things, by the way, in reading about this is Larry Woodcock uh, said that he does not want the death penalty um, for uh, Chad. He'd rather him just sit in prison for a lifetime. So that's an interesting take. Um, Eric Faddis, back to you. I remember the question. We don't have it up the comment, but it was something along the lines of John Pryor is incredibly annoying as a defense attorney. He grates on people. How big a factor is that? We saw that, by the way, recently in the Michelle Traconis trial, who was convicted in a difficult case to get a conviction. Uh, and people did not like her attorney, mainly because he was objecting every five seconds. He wasn't letting the um, narrative flow. But here you've got a guy that's kind of acerbic. Uh, can that be a problem because jurors are humans just like you and I? Oh, yeah. I mean, as, as an attorney, especially a defense attorney, especially in a high-profile case, you want to zealously advocate for your client, but that can go too far sometimes. And, and um, you know, especially when we're talking about not, not just a child death case, but a double child death case, you've got to proceed kind of gingerly and delicately uh, at, at some portions of that. And look, these jurors are humans, right? The, 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 these are human dynamics and, and, and people, you know, tend to agree with people they like more. There are, there are psychological studies on that. And so um, I, I think it should not be discounted the fact that you want to try to be likable in there. And some people think John Pryor might uh, ha not be that likable. <laughs> mm. and, and Lori and Gigi, starting with uh, good Lori first, back to the uh, remorse question. Do you think um, Chad's even capable of showing remorse? I just feel like he's always got the exact same ex expression on his face, no matter what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and and I don't know where this stillness comes from. If you uh, remember Lori Vallow's uh, police interviews on the day that that uh, Charles was murdered, she sits in this police interview room, cross-legged in sort of an overstuffed chair. And the only way that you know that the that 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 video is still running is you can hear voices in the next room as they're interviewing Tylee in the next room. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sure. She is so utterly still. And I, I don't know if that's sort of a, a, a prayer uh, and meditation sort of practice, but um, Chad always has that same sort of utter stillness in the courtroom. Um, and I think it's a little odd. I, I, I never, I, I don't really recall seeing other people behave that way in court. You could put um, a cardboard cut out of Chad at the defense table and nobody would <laughs> know. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So Gigi, I mean, you don't think we're going to see him like break down crying or anything, do you? No, he's not. Oh. I, don't, I, I don't, I don't see this guy capable of much emotion, even before the murders. I don't know. He just comes off to me as just this empty shell. I don't know. I mean, I had to read his book on a dare and then I told the listeners about it. And it's so bizarre. He has such a juvenile sense of humor. I mean, good grief. All you got to do is read Loin Fire to find that out. It's like two middle schoolers experimenting with writing dirty. It's horrible. But, you know, it's just his mind. It, it's weird the way he thinks. It's just um, he talks about hitting a, a, a grave that had a child in it when he was a, a grave digger. And I, I forget he, he said it. Something, you know, 
that was meant to be sort of sympathetic. And then he said something about it's always poignant when you bury a child. But it, it's like, then he'll follow it up with something funny. It's just very socially awkward. And so I think a lot of that comes into play with emotions when you're socially awkward. I don't know. He's just a weirdo. I mean, and I'm not trying to be rude, but the guy just is odd as a God. I, no, I don't want to say that. I don't, I don't want to encourage him, but you know, he's just bizarre. Yeah, he's got kind of like a vacant expression sometimes. Yeah. He seems yeah. to like dissociate and like he's almost somewhere it's, else. And it's it like is somebody kind of forgot to hit the switch on his back, you know, and took yeah. the on button on. A hundred percent. Cynthia Keith has a good description. Chad has the face of a large mouth bass. Same for the lawyer defending him. Uh, then we've got this comment. I think uh, the stillness is a fight or flight response. Who knows? We need a psychologist on that. But we've got a former felony prosecutor and current criminal defense uh, and civil litigator and Eric Faddis, uh, founding partner at Varner Faddis Elite Legal. I love that. What a great name. Court TV, ABC, NBC, Long Crime, Newsmax. You will see him on all of those networks. Eric Faddis, um, does the state get a conviction here? Your final thoughts. I think um, the odds are high that there is going to be a conviction. Um, the real fight could take place at the death penalty phase. Um, th that's where things are a little more murky, that there's never a guarantee in a death penalty case one way or the other. Um, so I think I think um, chances are, are pretty pretty high that there'll be a conviction. Uh, but whether Chad will be sentenced to death, that, that's, that remains to be seen. Uh, time will tell. Ten weeks. Uh, you've got... The good Lori, as she is known, Lori Hellis, an author and a retired criminal defense attorney. You heard her say her longest trial in her 30 year career was two weeks. And this guy's got to go 10 weeks. Uh, she moved to Boise, Idaho to write the book. You see the cover behind her, Children of Darkness and Light. It's also the name of her YouTube channel. And she's got a blog called The Lori Vallow Story. But get out there and buy the children of darkness and light show support. You're going to find out some interesting things that you have not heard on this show or elsewhere. Lori, uh, will there be a conviction in this case? And uh, what are you looking for next? Yeah, I think odds are, are good that, uh, that there will be a conviction. And I agree with Eric. I think that the, probably the fireworks are going to happen in the penalty phase. But I do think we're going to see a much juicier trial if, for trial watchers, for people who who really enjoy uh, uh, watching trial lawyers. I think we're going to see a much more spirited trial than we did with Lori's. Buckle hey, Joel, up, everyone. I got yeah. to tell you, I'm hoping I'm going to see a crime con because I'm going to bring my book and get you to sign it. Awesome. And I'm going to do the same. So uh, for full disclosure... We've not really formally been invited to CrimeCon yet, which made me uh, shed a tear or two. But uh, either way, the COE, the notorious COE and I decided we are going. Um, and I know Hidden True Crime is going. And I know my friend Josh Ritter is going with um, his podcast. So uh, and, and none of us have formally been invited, but we're going to do. Um, a book sign in there. We're going to do a get together, a, a couple of different things. And obviously we're going to see Lori and Gigi. Uh, Eric's probably smart enough to stay back in uh, Colorado. Um, but if Eric is there, obviously I would hang out with Eric. And the first thing I would do is uh, check out his giant tat on his back. But uh, I'll have to do that another time. Probably. We can exchange so hair tips too, Joe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about what product we use in our hair. It'll be, it'll be riveting. Um, Gigi McKelvey, uh, what can you say about her? She is the OG rock star of podcasting, host of Pretty Lies and Alibi. She spent six weeks in Boise, Idaho, covering Lori Vallow Daybell. You heard her say she's going to be going back and forth for Chad's case. 50 podcasts on this case um, that she has done, so no one really knows it better than Lori or Gigi, and I mean good Lori. Are we going to hear about the storm, Gigi, the sexy text messages? Um, by the way, Gigi, do you find Chad to be a sex symbol? Joel, uh, don't make me lose the coffee I just enjoyed throughout the show, please. <laughs> Look, I, somebody, uh, I, I did a reading of one fire and I took it offline because I have high schoolers and like I didn't want their friends to find it. But I said, you know, Chad's probably if he wants to write a book, he could write Chatty Potter and the Goblet of Loin Fire. That would be a bestseller. But no, I, I think that, um, gosh, it's going to be a good trial. I think that we're going to learn a lot more than we did in Lori's, to be honest with you. And I am ready to see this just uh, this phase come 
full circle with a guilty verdict, I don't think it's going to take much. Um, I, there's just more on Chad than there was on Lori. You know, she she was really good at keeping her hands clean in everything she put her hands in uh, throughout the years, not just with Chad, but in other situations. But um, we see where that landed her. Uh, I think Chad's day is coming. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think that dude's going to fare well in prison. Mm. Uh, yeah, I would have to agree with you. Just like our friend, Charlie Adelson, Gigi, who is, uh, having a rough go of it. It's going to be interesting to see if that guy survives prison. Um, don't wish death on anyone, but he is targeted in there. Uh, Chad will be targeted in there as well. Um, that's one thing there is, I've had enough former inmates to know that there is a, uh, prison code and they do not like child killers and, uh, they might get their comeuppance as they say. So, uh, once again, um, I don't even have to say it. It's, it's the best panel in all of true crime. You're not going to find a panel like this anywhere. It's not just a tagline. It's our reality. And you just saw it firsthand. Even London, the UK saw it. And so did Black Widow, my friend in the Republic of Ireland. Everyone across the world knows that we've got the best guests in true crime. And I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I will be on Court TV with Vinny Politan tonight. Uh, the demons are coming back, I think. But I'll be on Court TV um, with Vinnie Politan tonight at eight o'clock until then. Love you, America. Tomorrow we're talking Diddy with, uh, Scott and Phil the best. Thank you to Eric. Thank you to Gigi. Thank you to the good Lori. Love you, America. Love you, South Carolina. Love you, Colorado. Love you, Boise, Idaho. And let's keep JJ, uh, and Ty Lee and, uh, Tammy Daybell in our thoughts. Uh, panel stick around one second. If I can hear you.